Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, Mauricio. I really um, am really thrilled to be back here at the Bildner Center. Um, it's very much a place that I consider an intellectual home. It was a wonderful place. Uh, it ran wonderful programs and a supportive place for my, to, for my research during the 11 years that I was at John Jay from 2002 to 2013. Um, and now that I'm back at, uh, at Baruch College in the School of Public Affairs, it's really nice to reconnect with the Builder Center and present some of my work here. Um, the presentation I'm going to make today is entitled Criminal Enterprises and Governance in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and it's based on a book that I published last year with Cambridge University Press entitled Criminal Enterprises and Governance in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so Latin America is the global region that has uh, the highest homicide rates in the world. Counts across Latin America, about 50% of citizens would support a military coup um, to uh, control crime. Um, it is 27.5 homicides per 100,000 inhabitants, and individual countries in the region have much higher rates and make up a large portion of the top 10 countries in terms of homicide rates globally, El Salvador, Venezuela, Jamaica, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, um, have particularly high homicide rates. Colombia's homicide rates nationally have dropped, but um, you know remain relatively high. And then there are countries like Brazil and Mexico, which have more middling average homicide rates, but which are very large countries, and where certain cities have particularly high homicide rates. But when we talk about violence, when we talk about homicide rates, that really only tells us part of the story of crime and violence in Latin America, because a lot of the crime that happens isn't necessarily visible. It isn't necessarily gunfire in the streets. It's not necessarily finding bodies. It's not necessarily even having cars um, stolen off the street um, at gunpoint. Um, a lot of the crime that goes on uh, is crime of collusion. It's crime that involves relationships with state officials. Um, it involves extortion. It involves silencing people. And to the extent that it involves killing people, it involves killing people often in ways that don't show up in official statistics and don't make it into the newspaper. Um, there are two... Uh, existing approaches uh, that my my approach sort of my, my book responds to. Well, it doesn't show up on the screen, so that's not going to work. Um, the first is uh, the institutional approach um, to addressing crime, which has which has been the dominant approach uh, to understanding crime in Latin America for many years. And what this approach says is that we get more crime in Latin America because of institutional failure. Right? Why does crime happen? It's because the police don't do their job well enough. It's because the police might be a bit corrupt, it's because they don't, they don't have enough uh, resources and materiel, or because they just don't have the right policies and, uh, in, in place to control the crime that their, countries, that their country or their city are confronting. Right? And the solution to addressing this problem is you know, making the state better, building institutional capacity. And so I think that that's a partial solution, right? but only a part of the solution, um, in, that it's, in, that, in that the problems of crime go well beyond right, the visible effects of, of violence um, that are caused by breakdowns in state action, break, a breakdown in state action. An alternative approach that's developed in recent years, I refer to as the conflict approach, it's been developed by people such as, it's been, it's been a result of the importation of certain ideas developed by Stathis Kalivas in the context of the civil conflict literature, um, but developed in the context of crime by people like David Kilcullen, who's a defense analyst, Ben Lessing at the University of Chicago and, uh, uh, and Helica Dora Martinez at, at uh, University of Massachusetts Lowell. And they tried, and they tried to understand violence um, in the context of <clears throat> the nature of the conflict between state and criminal actors, right? So the way in which state and criminal actors fight produces different levels of violence. Um, and so this is a more nuanced approach than, than, the institution, than the institutional approach, where you're just looking at whether the state's effective or not effective. Right? The state confronts different actors. It seeks to resolve conflicts with different actors. Um, and you can, you, you can sort of talk about gradients of violence. But like the institutional approach, it lacks nuance. Right? It tells us where there's violence and where there isn't violence. And it tells us where there's more violence or less violence. Right? It can tell us you know, where things are on a scale of violence. But it doesn't tell us a lot about what happens where there isn't a lot of violence going on. And a particular fail of failure of both approaches is that neither approach really digs into the question of how the Latin American state <coughs> itself is contributing to violence in the region. The way in which different types of collusion between state actors, between police, and criminal actors at you know, the heights of criminality, the Pablo Escobars of Latin America, um, and, and even lower level criminal actors, the leaders of mafias and gangs and extortion rackets, the way those types of collusions tend to reproduce 
try. And so I think the, the most pernicious element of a lot of these approaches, of the institutional and the conflict studies approach, is they sort of let state officials who are corrupt and who are helping to reproduce crime off the hook. When state officials say, well, the war's not going, the war with crime isn't going right, or we just don't have the right policies to solve this problem, these other approaches ignore the fact that a lot of the problem with crime is very much the fact that the state is promoting and defending secretly these criminal organizations. Right? So my approach is, is an alternative to those of these. I refer to it as the, as the hybrid governance approach. It's an approach that I've been developing for some years initially in an edited volume that I did entitled Violent Democracies in Latin America with Daniel Goldstein, um, <clears throat> where I argue that in Latin America, criminal groups are not so much in conflict with the state as in collaboration with elements of the state, in complex, uneven, and often contentious collaboration. Um, and they work together. Um, to generate different types of governance and different types of order. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if the institutionalists or the conflict studies approach scholars are correct, right, what you're going to see is more or less violence. You're going to see places where there's crime and violence associated with it, right, or places where that's been brought under control, where the states reestablished control or negotiated some sort of peace. But if I'm right, Right? If the hybrid governance approach is right, what you're actually going to see is where you have different types of criminal organizations in place, you're going to see different types of not just violence, not just different practices of violence, but different practices of politics. Elections are going to run different ways. Civil society is going to be operating in different ways. And the policy process itself is going to run in different ways. So how did I do my research for this project? So this project is a three-city, six-neighborhood, nested study of criminal governance processes in three cities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Kingston, Jamaica, Medellin, Colombia, and Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. All three cities have a long history of intense criminal activity and violence. Right? They're all cities that have sort of been places that have been crisis centers, you know, places that have attracted a substantial amount of international attention about the long history of criminal violence that has gone on in each of those cities. But what I did in each of those cities is I picked two neighborhoods, two relatively similar neighborhoods where criminal organizations operate, right? So, you know, neighborhoods that are similar in terms of their, you know, compos <coughs> the, the composition of their inhabitants, right? Their, their general proximity, um, you know, and they're, of course, part of the same city, right? So they're subject to the same institutional structures, but that are organized under very different types of criminal organizations. And what I'm going to see, what I'm going to talk about, right, what I'm seeking to find out is how different types of criminal organizations affected the practices of politics, affected the practice of securities in those neighborhoods. I'm only dealing with six communities, so I developed, in, in the end, a fairly schematic model um, based on two variables. So on the X variable, you have the nature of engagement between the state and the criminal organization in the neighborhood. Right? So on the right-hand side of the graph, you have greater degrees of collaboration. And on the left-hand side of the graph, you have greater degrees of contention. And by this, I do not mean that there isn't collaboration, just that there is more tension. There's always some collaboration in all of the cases that I'm looking at, right? But sometimes it's, it's a collaboration that yields more open violence, more, comp more, more violence. It's a tenser and difficult and more difficult type of collaboration. Often it's more clandestine and it's operating at a lower level of the state. Often lower level state officials are sort of leading this, but certainly not always. Um, on the y-axis, you have um, the degree of criminal consolidation in the neighborhood. You have a well-organized mafia running the neighborhood, where there's sort of one big gang leader that runs the area, one mafia don that runs the area. Or do you, do you have an umbrella, a federal type of structure in the neighborhood where you have a bunch of different organizations that are negotiating with each other? Or do you have organizations that are isolated from one another and often in confrontation with one another? This yields four different cases, which I'll talk about in more detail here on this chart. Um, so in the lower right-hand corner, and, and this talk is largely about, I'm going to talk in more detail about the policymaking process in these neighborhoods. So I'm going to use this chart to briefly go through the first three um, areas that I, the, the first three effects of these types of, of governance structures, these micro-level governance regimes that I study. 
Um, in, in this chart, and I'll discuss the, the policy process in, in more detail later in the, in the talk. So um, in the lower right-hand corner, you have uh, what I refer to as a condition of criminal disorder. Right? So this is a space where criminal organizations are divided, and they do not have strong relationships with the state. Um, I found this in one neighborhood in Medellin, an area called Comuna Trece, a um, very poor area where there's been a long presence of, of guerrillas. Um, and the state um, had come through in the early 2000s and smashed uh, the guerrilla structures and was making a big effort when I was doing when I was there trying to keep these small criminal organizations that had su succeeded the guerrillas and the paramilitaries in the area from coming together and organizing themselves. So the state was really making an effort to keep them isolated from one another. These groups didn't have strong relationships with each other. This was by far the most publicly violent place that I worked. I would show up in the morning. I would seek to show up relatively early in the morning. Um, and people would you know, try to get there before 10 or before 11. So I guess that's actually sort of late in the morning. But criminals sleep late, as it happens. Um, but I try and get there before they got out of bed. And the, the neighborhood was relatively peaceful when I arrived. But then once people started getting up, getting out of bed, gunfire would almost invariably start. People would start shooting at each other in the street. People would attack each other. People would stand on roofs. There were four little gangs in the neighborhood, and they would shoot at each other just across the neighborhood. People in the neighborhood were inured to the violence. Um, they would sit, and they would watch people shoot at each other. Um, and I've, you know, I've been in a lot of violent places. I've never seen people do that. Um, it was a very insecure area. Lots of people were dying um, because of this open conflict. On the other hand, these were very weak organizations with very loose relationships to the state. These organizations did not have the capacity or the sophistication to control civic groups. Rather, when civic groups that were active in the community wanted to engage in different types of public events, wanted to bring people into the community, they would negotiate truces with those organizations to keep them from fighting at different times. But these organizations had no control over the civic organizations. Um, elections happened relatively freely. Certainly, there were limits on when a politician could come in and, and campaign, because you couldn't walk in when gunfire was going on. But on the other hand, the criminal organizations couldn't control the, the, the politicians who were seeking to campaign in there. They needed to provide, the, the politicians needed to provide some security for themselves, but that's how um, things work. But they didn't exercise a lot of control. And in terms of governance, I'll discuss this in more detail later, they also had very little control. If we move up to the upper left-hand side of the chart, we have what I call divided governance, which I found in a place called Hossinha in Rio de Janeiro and in the Comuna Uno in northeastern Medellin. These are places where you have more consolidated criminal groups. Um, but with complicated, contentious, and occasionally collaborative relationships with the state. There are, you have a relatively contentious relationship with criminal organizations at, at times. So um, you might have like, you know, a gun battle break out between state actors and these criminal groups once a month, once every few months. It can be an intense gun battle because you have a fairly um, well-structured criminal organization. But at the same time, this criminal organization and the state actors also have a lot of interest in negotiating with each other and accommodating each other. So there are extended moments of peace. It's not like in, in the case of criminal disorder where you just have a lot of small groups that are fighting with each other. Here you have a well-organized criminal group um, that controls the area um, and for the most part maintains some order, but occasionally um, there are outbreaks of significant violence in the community that are terrifying to residents. Civic groups in this case play an important role in mediating the relationship between criminal organizations and the state. In these cases, um, these organizations um, actually seek to control certain civil, civic organizations. They'll kick leaders out. They'll impose their own leadership, who will then negotiate, serve as key interlocutors between them and state officials in their efforts to negotiate and maintain those relationships. Um, in terms of elections, these organizations can control which politicians gain access to the community. Um, they can charge them money. They can expect patronage from them at certain times. Um, and they make arrangements around this. But for the most part, they, can, they don't control the election process with a tremendous amount of nuance. In one case I was researching, they put their own candidate forward who was successfully elected. Um, when it came to light that he was connected to this criminal gang, it became a major issue in the newspapers. And he spent the rest of his political career under investigation. This is very different, however, from the upper right-hand corner, which I refer to as collaborative governance. Here, the state has strong relationships with criminal organizations. The criminal organizations are very well organized in these spaces. Um, and as a result of these, this high level of criminal organization and their positive relationships with the state, you have 
mostly peace in these communities. You can walk into these communities, and it's like, you know, a lot of people talk about New York, like going down to like Little Italy back in like the 1930s or 1940s or 1950s, and you were like safe. You would go into the neighborhood, and nothing would happen to you. Um, these are areas that are really sort of under mafia control. Um, and you can go in there, you can do business. You can go, you know, buy a t-shirt, you can go out to a nightclub, uh, as occurs in one of the communities that I worked in in Rio de Janeiro that had this place called Rio das Pedras or Denham Town in Kingston. Um, and this neighborhood, um, um, you were relatively, you were safe. Occasionally, um, uh, maybe once a decade in Kingston, um, relationships would flare up with the state. Something would break down as it happened. Um, right before I did my research, the US government demanded that the leader of this gang be extradited uh, to the United States for trial. Um, the government didn't want to comply, but they were ultimately forced to um, under their treaty obligations. And that led to a state incursion in the community that left 72 people dead. Utterly terrifying violence, but it happened about once a decade. Um, so it's one sort of limited case. Um, and then most of the time, the community was at peace. In this community, though, the civic groups are controlled by the criminal organizations. Civic groups cannot operate. Um, civic groups are silenced. Leaders of civic groups in here, the Pedras, would be murdered by the criminal organization. Um, in, in, in Denham Town, uh, they were essentially completely dependent on the criminal organization for advancing different initiatives. Um, and the criminals sort of run the, the civic life of the community. Um, and civic groups are left advocating to the criminals rather than the state. In terms of elections, um, in Rio das Pedras, one of the criminals was elected to the city council. Um, in Denham Town, the, the electoral process was completely dominated by the criminal groups. There were certain precincts in the area uh, where you would have turnout uh, in excess of 100% of registered voters. So you might have like 105 registered, 100 registered voters and 104 votes for the politician aligned with the, uh, with, the, with the criminal gang. And then you might have one or two other people who did not vote for them. And those people could be targeted. And in fact, uh, for violence, uh, for expulsion from the community. Um, one person told me that um, if people refused to turn out to vote, um, they would be beaten um, by people associated with the criminal groups. So, right, they, criminal violence also drove turnout in the community and controlled who was nominated for these different uh, seats by the political party um, in some cases. And I'll talk about the, the policy process in this neighborhood um, in the second part of the presentation. And the final case I want to talk about is what I refer to as tiered or layered governance. And this is um, a situation where you have divided criminal organizations, but where they all have some relationship with the state. And the state mediates their conflicts among them to prevent them from flaring up into open violence. In these cases, um, these, these, these places have relatively independent civic groups, but that devote a lot of their time just trying to mediate between the interests of different criminal groups and also stopping that violence from breaking out, the division between the criminal groups doesn't drive civic action, but it limits it. It slows it down um, because criminal civic groups don't need to negotiate with just the state. They also need to negotiate with the very criminal actors in the community. And finally, in terms of elections, um, this, the state works with these groups. So these groups follow the dictates of state officials or party officials. And I found this in one case in Kingston in a place called Backbush. This area. Um, Basically, the criminal gangs it, it, it ensured that people in the neighborhood voted in the way that criminal organizations, uh, that, the, that the politicians, that the criminal organizations were responsible to, um, wanted them to. And this also affected governance processes. So I already talked about my six cases. Two in Medellin, Comuna Trece, Comuna Uno, Kingston, Denham Town, Backbush, Rio de Janeiro, um, Jocinha, and Rio de Pedras. Um, and now I'm going to talk about pol the policymaking process in each of these neighborhoods. So my concepts of policymaking are based on policy co-production ideas developed by people like Peter Evans, Eleanor Ostrom, um, Judith Tendler back in the 1990s and early 2000s. And th this model of policymaking is one in which the state makes policy, but it works with civic organizations to get community buy-in to the different policies that are going to be implemented in different areas, and works with the community to understand the policies and to help convince the state to better tailor the policies and implement them in such a way that they work for the community. And this, this, this back and forth effort, right? This, this collaborative effort of policymaking helps to generate better policies for, for the needs of the community, but at the same time generates political, upward political support for the government and for its policies, right? So it gets greater compliance with policies is the idea. OK, so what happens with policymaking amid criminal disorder? Mostly nothing. <laughs> 
This is the same chart that I just showed you with four criminal organizations added to it. Um, criminal organizations do not affect the policy banking process in these neighborhoods much at all. Rather, what they do is they create friction. Right? So if the government wants to build a road or you know, bring in piped water into a neighborhood, they can do it. The criminal organization isn't going to try and manipulate the policy. But the government is not effective in these areas at controlling criminal organizations. So when they go in to pave the road or to lay down the pipes for the water, you don't know when violence is going to break out. So the government has to spend more money on providing security in the area. Sometimes the government has to cancel work for a day if there's too much violence in the community. So the policy co-production process tends to work. Civic organizations operate the way you'd expect them to operate more widely in society as a potential collaborator for the government to help mediate relationships with society. But criminal organizations create friction right, and slow down the policy process. I was present in the Comuna Teresa one night before a participatory budgeting meeting. There was a state official who came into the neighborhood to sort of talk through the rules with a civic organization that was going to lead that process in the next day. And a gun, gunfight broke out in the middle of it. And so half the rules got explained. And then the civic leader was, and the government official was like, I got to get out of here. This is crazy. There's too much gunfire. So there was a, you know, the gunfire paused. And then he and I left. Um, but some things got explained. They got explained a little bit more quickly, a little bit more haphazardly. Um, but it happened, and the next day the, the event happened, and there wasn't, as far as I know, criminal interference. Um, so here's a situation where there's relatively little effect, right? Um, the government leads policymaking, benefits generally accrue to residents. Um, uh, but there is this violence that can often decrease the sort of, sort of the confidence and the ability of the state to do its job, because you know these are tense situations, and um, it increases costs and slows down the advance of these projects. The next case is divided governance. And here, things become more complicated. Um, this is a much more complicated model of the policymaking process. And what you have here is criminal organizations really dominating the relationship um, at the bottom of the chart with the community. Right? They are the pro principal interlocutor with the community. But the criminal organizations cannot interact directly with the state for a host of reasons. As it happens, you know, very often these are like drug trafficking gangs, and they're limited in scope and size, and they don't have the ability to sort of pay off the right politicians or establish the strongest relationships with the state. So they need to have their relationships with the state mediated through civic organizations, right? And in these cases, the criminal organizations will pressure the civic organizations. They'll remove leaders from those civic organizations. They'll put in leaders allied to them. And they'll use that relationship to manipulate the negotiation with the state to tailor, to attempt to tailor the policymaking process in the neighborhood to the interests of the criminals. So in Hosinia, you know, the government was investing in infrastructure. And the criminals were seeking to manipulate the policymaking process, which was an, an engagement between civic officials and state officials about what the community needed, so that at least some of those, that infrastructure development in the community met the criminal's needs rather than, say, the interests of the state or the interests of residents. So they were interposing themselves in the policymaking process. In the, in, in the Comuna Uno, um, there was a participatory budgeting process, and there would be a participatory budgeting debate, all, very often manipulated by the criminals, semi-clandestinely. When eventually certain civic organizations got contracts from the government, the criminals would go to them and say, OK, well, you know, you've got to pass a cut of this money now. And then the civic leaders would say, well, you know, I still have to do all this stuff. And the criminals would say, well, that doesn't make any difference to me. You're going to pay me 10% of your money. Um, and that's how that worked. Um, so this is a situation where you have a policymaking process. Um, civic organizations can have an effect. It's not always under the control of criminal groups. But criminal groups can influence the policymaking process. And they also impart can derive some benefits from that policymaking process. So this is a situation where it's a state-led policymaking process with clandestine armed actor input. Benefits go somewhat to criminals. Um, and it provides armed actors with some income and maybe some additional legitimacy. This brings us to collaborative governance, which I find in Denham Town and Rio de Pedras. And here, criminal organizations really dominate the policymaking process. Right? They're in the middle. They interpose themselves between the state, uh, with, who they negotiate with directly, and the, the residents of the community. Civic organizations, to the extent that they operate, negotiate with criminal organizations right, to get the criminal organizations to do what they want. But the negotiations with the state are run by the criminal organizations. In, in Rio das Pedras, one of the members of the criminal organization was on the city council. So he just had to allocate part of the city budget for the neighborhood himself in the city council. 
Um, and, you know, they would do things like control the soccer field, right? And they would charge everybody who wanted to play on the soccer field some money. Um, and residents didn't necessarily mind this because they kicked some of the money back into maintaining a nicer soccer field than many favelas in Rio de Janeiro have. Um, in Denham Town, uh, the criminal organizations often have control over, if you're going to build public housing, they have control over who gains access to the public housing. Um, one civic leader told me that they started a parenting group in the community and they needed to get approval from the criminal organization to allow the parenting group to operate. And then the criminal group sort of worked with the parenting group to get compliance from residents and children with the different things the parenting group wanted in the, in the neighborhood. Right? So the criminal organization really, in this case, plays a central role in the policymaking process. Um, here, the policymaking process is led by the armed actor. Benefits do derive to the community itself. Um, and, and it really tends to, in these cases, reinforce armed actor power. Right? They control it. They decide where the money goes, and the armed actor accrues a significant amount of resources and legitimacy through the policymaking process under these cases. This leads us, lastly, to tiered governance or layered governance. And this is a place where you have three, where you have multiple different criminal organizations that are engaged with the state. Here, the state leads the policymaking process. The civic groups sort of can influence the policymaking process, but they're constantly negotiating with criminal groups to get some consensus among those groups in terms of the things that they want to advocate for. So for example, if they want to build a community center in one part of the neighborhood, they've got to go talk to the, the, the criminal groups, right? And the criminal groups, some of the criminal groups, might object to where they want to place it. Because if it's in the area that's controlled by one criminal group and not another criminal group, they may upset one of the criminal groups. They may accept the criminal groups that don't get the, the, the neighborhood center in their, the area they control. So that is a complicated negotiation process. Um, in terms of policy making, if the government wants to build a road, what they do is they, they tell the criminal organizations, you each are going to get a cut of the money that's coming in. You're each going to have a decision about, you're each going to be able to contribute some workers from your sector of the community. And they sort of divide up the resources, and then they implement it. So the criminals benefit from this, but they don't drive the policy making process in this case. Right? So it's a state-led policy making process. The benefits are mixed, um, and it provides some low-level um, political support in terms of the ability of the criminal groups to give out jobs and eco in economic support to the criminal organizations. And so what I've talked about here in some detail um, with regards to the policy making process shows that under different types of criminal governance, different types of micro-level armed regimes, right, collaborative governance, divided governance, tiered governance, or layered governance, and criminal disorder, you get very different types of policy making processes and very different effects of policymaking in those neighborhoods. So what does this mean? Um, I've talked about the existence of different types of criminal organizations at the beginning of the talk and the way in which they govern, right? And how this points to some of the deficiencies of existing strategies to control criminal activity and criminal violence in Latin America, right? So we talked earlier about the institutional and the complex studies approach. And I think my approach has clearly shown that it's, this isn't just about violence, right? It's not just about the operation of criminal groups. It's not just about when dead bodies appear in the newspaper or when people hear gunfire. It's about when, there's, when violence occurs that you can't hear or can't even see or it's very hard to perceive where violence doesn't make it into official statistics or into newspapers in many cases. I think the discussion that I provided provides a more complete explanation of the different types of violence that exist in the region and the different types of criminal activity that exist in the region. Um, and they point to very different ways under these circumstances that democratic governance is lived by the residents of the neighborhoods where there exist different types of criminal governance, different types of what I refer to in the book of micro-level armed regimes. If we want to talk about responses to crime, right? it's not just if, if this, these types of micro-level armed regimes exist. It's not just about improving the capacity of the police or developing better policies or seeking to control conflicts between criminals. It involves a much more ample basket of policies that are tailored to the particular types of criminal governance that exist in different neighborhoods where criminals operate. Right? So the territorial control of criminal groups and the types of relationships they maintain with the state produce different governance structures. But as you get these different governance structures, that requires different types of responses. Right? And so what I, what I provide in, in this chart um, are 
a, you know, a, a, a sort of rubric of under the different types of organized criminal structures, criminal disorder, divided governance, collaborative governance, and layered governance, different types of responses. So in divided governance, you have a lot of petty crime and you have a lot of violence. Um, and this is a place where you need criminological interventions. You need better lighting. You need to put police on the ground so that they suppress the possibility of people fighting with each other. <coughs> um, but you also need, um, as a response, right, community building, trying to get citizens involved and creating norms in the communities. Um, but as criminals become more organized, right, those basic criminological interventions, just having better lighting on the street, aren't going to solve the problems. Right? You have to begin to deal with you know, sophisticated organized crime groups. Right? You need improved criminal investigative strategies in those neighborhoods. Right? And, it, and you also need the reestablishment of territorial control. Right? You need not just police presence to suppress violence in certain places, but you need sort of an ongoing structural police um, establishment in the neighborhood, right? And you better cycles of patrols and the ability of the government to fully access the community and maintain control. As you move over um, to collaborative governance, um, you know, this is the place where you have well-organized criminal organizations with very strong relationships with the state. You really need to begin talking about political investigations and oversight. You're talking about parliamentary investigations, legislative investigations. You're talking about things like CCG in Guatemala, right? The, the anti-corruption, the, the national anti-corruption investigation that was internationally controlled. Um, you're talking about much more robust investment. In Jamaica, um, you're talking about the establishment of um, Sort of, a, there was a, I think the, the office was the office of the contractor general that monitored government contracts for corruption and spending to make sure that when government issued contracts, the criminals weren't benefiting from those contracts and other types of corruption weren't going on. Generally speaking, when you have well, or when you have strong relationships between criminal organizations and the state, you also need to think about state building and state reform to bring broader types of corruption under control. And as you're dealing with different types of group conflict, political conflict, group conflict, multiple criminal groups the state's trying to mediate or that are operating independently of each other and that are fighting, you do need to think about peace building. You need to think about ceasefires and different types of intervention. Um, and with disaggregated groups especially, but also as you can peel groups out of these more, individuals out of these more organized groups, you need to think about um, you know, different types of demobilization strategies for criminal organizations, but you also need to think about increasing state society engagement around solving problems, social integration, um, and, and you know, times even spatial design, how you design neighborhoods to be safer. At the center of all of this, I think, are doctrinal changes uh, and improvements in data acquisition and use. The places in Latin America that have done the best job controlling crime and violence are the places like Colombia and certain cities in Brazil that have led the way, that have pioneered the development of georeferenced crime data, right? So Colombia, um, Recife, which is a terribly violent city in Brazil, went through a period of time where it had a lot of success in, in bringing down violence levels, in part because it brought in high quality georeferenced crime data and developed the capacity across the state to develop different types of interventions to help um, control violence. And the last thing that I would point out is that solving problems of crime in Latin America aren't just about saying, hey, I've got a policy that works for you here. It's about developing capacity in those Latin American cities, states, and countries not just to develop and implement a policy, but to understand how policies change over time, how the needs for policies change over time, as the type of criminal governance changes, as the type of criminal activity changes. Policymakers need to be aware that they have to constantly evolve, that their policies, their responses to crime have to constantly evolve. Right? So having the capacity to develop policies, having the knowledge that you know, we're going to implement a policy now, but that we're going to review the policy, and that every four or five, three, four or five years, we're going to develop major revisions to those policies to address the crime problem as it's evolving is essential to responding to crime. Thank you so much for your attention. How do you deal with it when there's corruption at every level of government? Or there are examples in Brazil where there are cities or state governments who've managed to be relatively, where there's relatively less corruption, but they managed to establish more control over the state government. Well, I mean, so Brazil is not the country that worries me the most. Jamaica is of these countries, because in Jamaica, the gangs were created by the political parties and are strongly tied to the political parties. So that's probably the place where the corruption is most challenging to unpack. Um, and it's a very small country, so there's not a huge amount of variability. Um, 
So in Jamaica, um, you know, you know, there is often public reaction to corruption scandals that, that results in, in some type of response. Um, when you're talking about a large country like Brazil, um, you know, Brazil is a very heterogeneous place, and there are more corrupt places and less corrupt places in Brazil. But even when you're talking about Rio de Janeiro, which has, you know, a fairly high degree of corruption, um, you know, there are there are a, a fair number of public officials with um, a substantial degree of integrity, um, and who do want to make their city and their state um, a better and safer place, um, and they often collaborate with like-minded politicians and like-minded civic actors to address these issues. Um, I don't know exactly where Rio is right now. I mean, crime has been getting worse. Um, getting worse. Yes. But, um, you know, over the years, there have been different successful collaborations um, that have successfully reduced crime at different moments. Um, a good example of this are the um, uh, police pacifying units, which a lot of people have talked about, got a lot of attention, uh, you know, between, say, 2010 and 2016. They emerged in part because the federal government was concerned that the city was hosting the Olympics and it wanted the Olympics to be relatively successful and not violent. Um, so where you had this sort of, you know, concerted in interest from the federal government, as they say in Brazil, right, for the English to see is the sort of the Brazilian, like, uh, saying goes, um, th there was a huge investment to make sure that everything went okay for the, uh, for the Olympics. Um, and the UPP program was actually very successful for, for some time. But as the program grew um, and as the Olympics got closer... The, the date of the Olympics got closer, there was less and less interest in investing further and in helping that program develop. So in certain shanty towns, it solved a problem at a particular moment. But as I said at the end of my talk, those problems changed, the nature of violence and conflict in the cities changed, and the program didn't evolve and it wasn't sufficiently expanded, right? And that was because there was a loss of interest in supporting that reformist impulse in the city and a loss of support for reformers in the city. Right, so you have a, you know, even in, in Brazil, you have this he a very heterogeneous environment, um, and I think there are usually people you can work with, um, but it's a very long uh, process, and people who are interested in helping to address the problem of violence need to be prepared to work with people for a long time, um, be prepared for setbacks, um, but... You know, if things are going to change, you need to promote uh, different types of collaboration. You need to empower local actors who are committed to the types of change in their city that will help to reduce crime. In, in Brazil, it turns out, I looked at the data for this presentation we had last week. It turns out that Sao Paulo, as, we, as I guess many years ago, mm -hmm. would have the lowest rates of homicide. That will be the most successful over the years. I think in the, there's a, a set of images by state over the last 15 years, and it's by far the lowest. I mean, it's unfair to ask you the question of why was that? Well, the, case, the, 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 Sao Paulo, the, the, the drop in Sao Paulo. But in, in, terms of, in terms of your theories, your institutional. Oh well, I mean, I mean, there's a so I mean, the the, the general consensus among a certain set of scholars is that um, at least some of the drop in crime in Sao Paulo is because the one single criminal organization, the Primero Comando da Capital, has taken over all criminal activity in the state and has consolidated criminal power in most shanty towns in, in the city um, and state. Uh, and that's helped dramatically to control crime and has enabled negotiations between that organization and certain sectors of the, um, uh, of the, of the state in Sao Paulo. Um, that, I think, is a partial explanation, um, it, you know, but basically there's a pretty strong relationship uh, between one criminal, one very powerful criminal organization and the state. But I think it's also important to reflect on the fact that um, Sao Paulo is a, is, is a, is a, is a well, very wealthy city that was one of the leaders in Brazil in the development of georeferenced crime data. It has a sophisticated police force um, that, is, that has the capacity to develop that policies. That has an excuse for being hardline. Well, at different moments, yeah. yeah. Uh, they certainly have a history of that. Um, but it's not just that they're hard line in some cases. It's also that they actually do have, you know, they, 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 they seek to allocate policing um, 
they seek to allocate policing resources in such a way as to control crime in the city. Um, and I think there's no, in, in the case of Sao Paulo, there is no single explanation for why crime is low. Um, so one, one explanation is, you know, the power of this gang. Another explanation is mass incarceration. So Sao Paulo does have a mass incarceration policy, probably as, the high, as one of the higher levels, if not the highest level of incarceration in the region right now. Um, and it's also a place where they've, they've been leaders in, in developing, you know, sort of targeted crime policy. And that's one case we may want to, want to go back to next year. Mm -hmm. any, any questions, comments? Ken? Ken, then, then, then you. Desmond, you concluded your talk with recommendations, basically what should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, did you give uh, a talk like this in your three countries? And if you didn't, you had conversations at least with the various parties, uh, that is police, politicians, criminal groups. I'm wondering how your your proposals and recommendations are received by the various actors in the various countries. Um, well, you have to understand that all these societies are heterogeneous, and that the people who want to talk to me are not at the various actors in the abstract. Um, so, people who invite me to give talks in Brazil are often the people who, you know, are already sympathetic to looking toward to, for solutions, right? So. I gave, I've given talks about this in Brazil, um, not this exact talk, but I've given talks about this in Brazil. Um, I thought it was relatively well received. Um, I've given talk about this in Mexico. Um, this chart I actually developed for a talk I gave in Mexico, and I thought that you know, people you know, responded to it um, relatively well. I've given talks about this in Colombia to more narrow, um, to, yeah, to more narrow audience. It's hard to remember where I've given all these talks. but. Um, you know, uh, my general feeling is that people listen to the talk and they appreciate the idea that there are different types of problems in their society and that, there is, that, that the problem of crime isn't a simple and straightforward problem. Um, yeah. But I certainly, I have not engaged with policymakers in the region from top to bottom to sort of push this forward. Some of these ideas I also developed for the 2013 UN Human Development Report, um, uh, which went into the, they went into the solutions chapter. Um, I don't know how much effect that's had, though. It's hard to tell when the, these UN documents go out, you know, how, much, how many policymakers actually take them seriously or how they react to them. Do you have any ideas why the, uh, the crime issue went against the Workers' Party in the elections in Brazil? <coughs> And in favor of Bolsonaro, well, by far. <coughs> I mean, in, in, Bolsonaro the, is a conservative candidate who won the elections, and he's organizing a very different <coughs> government versus from the one that the, the Workers' Party had, or even the PSDB, the Social Democratic Party. So I mean, a shift toward the more conservative. It's amazing because they did well in many areas. In Rio, they won. Well, yeah, but yeah, so I mean, so some of the stuff that's worth thinking about with that is that, um, so the PT lost because of the corruption scandal, <coughs> largely. I don't think because of the crime problem. The corruption. Yeah, the corruption. I mean, the corruption, you know, just really gutted their legitimacy, and I think that was the major reason why that happened. I mean, I think the most violent regions in the country, uh, in Brazil today, are in the Northeast. Those are the regions that still voted for the pit. It, it is by on a per So the people most affected by criminal violence actually probably tended to vote PT, um, whereas people who might be worried about criminal violence, um, but maybe not affected as directly by it, um, appear to have voted for Bolsonaro. We had somebody behind and then you. Yes. I was just wondering, as someone who doesn't often get to study areas of the world like this in detail, have you been able to identify any specific cultural or historical differences that make these types of collaborations difficult? Because it seemed that a lot of areas would benefit from more collaboration and, I don't want to say simpler, but faster solutions to stop some of the violence in the media to get other things done, but they aren't able to reach that point. Have you been able to identify what causes them to stop being able to reach that point? Well, I mean, I have a whole chapter on history in the book that I published. 
Um, and I think when we want to understand violence in any society, be it Brazil or the United States, you have to understand the historical roots of violence, right, and the ways in which different types of social patterns that exist at one moment produce violence at later moments. And my experience in all the countries I've worked in and the United States is that the history of violence in that country, you know, whether it's because of political polarization or racial polarization or, you know, connected to a history of civil conflicts, as the case in Colombia, um, <clears throat> that those tensions tend to um, continue across generations and centuries, right? And they evolve and change, but at different moments of social crisis, they erupt into different types of violence, which is why societies have so much trouble responding to them, because those types of violence emerge because there are interests and dynamics in those societies that are um, <clears throat> apt to fall into those types of violence, right? So why do these countries face this types of violence? Why do they fall into these types of violence, these particular moments of violence? It happens because of the history of violence in, in, in each of those countries and the way in which that history of violence reemerges at different moments. And in particular, in the cases that I look at in Latin America, you know, these are regions of the country where the poor and the working class have never been very well served by the political system, by social policy, um, <clears throat> or well incorporated into um, well incorporated into politics and political parties um, in, in constructive ways. Um, and violence, the, the type of violence that I'm looking at in each of these cases emerged in part because of the ways in which these governments over the course of the 20th century fail to adequately respond to the needs of these populations in the ways at different moments these populations and the government have um, ended up confronting each other. You had a... Uh... So, Desmond, I, you seem to be using the word violence and crime interchangeably. And I'm uh... wondering if that's correct. <laughs> And it would seem to me that, at the very least, I'd love to know more about variations within those two separate, you know, some kind, yeah. various kinds of violence, various kinds of crime. Are all of, are most of the criminal organizations organized around drug trafficking? I mean, I don't have a, a sort of sense about. And even let's say, if we think about the mafia in New Jersey, there wasn't a lot of violence involved, but it's definitely a criminal organization. So I don't myself. Yeah. No, I pr appreciate your question, and I agree with you. I keep actually trying to check myself on this <laughs> as I'm speaking, um, because I am trying to draw a distinction between the two, and I, I, I realize I'm not doing a very good job of that. I've caught myself a couple times, and I've tried to correct myself, but I appreciate you drawing my attention to that. Um, and yes, I think there is a distinction between crime and violence, right? I think there's a lot of crime that is nonviolent, and I think there's a lot of crime that is violent, right? And I'm, what I'm trying to draw people's attention to is that we need to look at crime beyond violence, right? Because the attention typically paid to crime, 90% of the crime that, that you know, gets into the newspapers or that we seek to develop policy around or that ends up on the news or that we worry about or that we write about is violent crime. We write about, we write about my talk started out talking about homicide rates in Latin America. That's sort of the top line conversation most of the time, right? What's going on with the homicide rates, right? And that is the most violent, most visible crime. Um, but if we really want to understand crime, right, we need to understand other modalities of crime where violence is much less visible, right? And that's been part of the, the point that I've been trying to make. Um, I think at times my language has been inadequate for that because Sometimes these things happen when we're giving talks. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, but um, in, in all the cases I look at, there's violence. Um, some of the violence is less visible, right? So, um, you know, in, in cri amid criminal disorder, you have gunfire every day, right? Amid, um, you know, collaborative governance, where you have these powerful criminal organizations engaged with the state, there might not be any gunfire during the day. Um, during, a, during a day. You may go months without hearing gunfire. It doesn't mean that people aren't terrified. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my experience is that people in those neighborhoods are often more terrified than in places where the violence is more public mm -hmm. because the assassinations are targeted. People disappear. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in some cases, you know, criminal organizations engage in exemplary punishments and exemplary ex executions, 
um, which is not um, something that often makes it into the statistics, right? Bodies disappear. Um, but people know when their cousin dies, even if they can't talk about it. Um, so there is a big distinction um, between violence and, and crime. And I think to understand criminal governance and the practice of crime in Latin America, we need to be paying as much attention to the violence that we hear and the violence that we see and the violence that shows up in official statistics mm -hmm. and the violence that only the people who experience it immediately or whose immediate relatives experience know about, right? Violence that's deliberately quiet, violence that police are paid off not to report, mm -hmm. bodies that disappear and are never heard from again. Uh, and if we under, want to understand crime and respond to crime, we need to be spending as much time responding to that as responding to other types of crime. And one of the big challenges in the region is precisely that government agencies tend to respond to, you know, the gunfight in the street, mm -hmm. right? The neighborhood where, you know, 10 people have shown up dead in the last five months, right? But they tend not to respond to, and they tend to work with the criminal organizations that keep things quiet. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we don't respond to those criminal organizations that are keeping things quiet, we're not doing justice to, you know, the political rights of the people who live in those neighborhoods. But also it's important to reflect on the fact that those powerful criminal organizations where the organizations are successful at keeping things quiet actually promote much more violent and visible crime in other <coughs> neighborhoods. Yeah. Could I just follow up briefly? The people who study crime, criminal organizations in the Balkans, have a term that may be used elsewhere to mock, Pax Mafiosi. Mm -hmm. Pax Mafiosi means when um, external events, exogenous factors, don't disrupt tra trafficking routes, everyone's got their own territory. And it's only when something happens, like sanctions get imposed on Serbia, and so all of a sudden the routes that are going from Afghanistan through Turkey, through Serbia, through Croatia, get disrupted and those who are controlling the routes start fighting over turf again. And that's where you get the violence. Otherwise you don't get any violence. Yes. So there's only so much that governments can do under those circumstances. But I'm re raising the example because it tells me that if, in this case it's because the crime is around drug trafficking, long distance. Mm -hmm. So I would assume that you get different kinds of violence and maybe even strategies for controlling it, depending upon what the criminal organizations, what they're doing. What they're doing, yeah, no, absolutely. So a lot of the criminal organizations that I looked at here have very heterogeneous business portfolios, okay. right? So in Medellin, the criminal organizations tend to do a lot of things. They'll be involved in micro-level trafficking. They might be involved in uh, you know, collections, they might be involved in extortion. Um, some of them clean buses, as it happens. Like, they extort the buses, but then they also provide an additional service of washing the buses um, that they're extorting. Um, uh, they, you know, will be trying to extort money. They'll be trying to racketeer around different government uh, businesses. Um, in Rio, of, of the three cities that I worked in, in Rio was the only case where you really had distinct modalities of crime. So one group there in Hosinia is a drug gang, and that's mostly what they do. And another group is an extortion racket, and they specifically and publicly issue drug trafficking. Um, but the other two cities, the, 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 the criminal organizations have a complex portfolio, business portfolio, as is, I think, the case in most other countries in the region where I've conducted research. So, I mean, if you talk about, if you talk about Bogota or Caracas or Mexico or Northern Central America, my understanding is, or what I've seen in my research in some of these places, is that, that, that you have very struck, that, that you have complex portfolios. You don't tend to have that type of distinction um, that you have in Rio. What I do, th so there's a couple, so in terms of the Pax Mafiosa you're talking about, I think there's a tendency that if you leave a criminal organization alone, they tend to become more organized and they tend to make better relationships with the state. So that is a tendency, but it can be a slow trajectory. And I think there are different dynamics that exist in different states that can slow down or accelerate the nature of those relationships and that consolidation. But I think where maybe the Balkans differs from the cases that I'm looking at is that I'm looking at cities in a pretty complex region. And so there's a lot of disruptions. And I 
have a whole separate slide that I have on different things that disrupt the trade and these different trades and generate conflict, which I don't have time to get into now. But there are a lot of different things that disrupt that process and unpack it at different moments, right? So you, you don't have like everything migrating and then consolidating and then bouncing back. It's, you have a lot of different back and forth um, and you have a lot more change and disorder, I think, than, than, than sort of the story you're telling me about the ball. And much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you partially or completely answered my question, but basically it was whether there's any correlation between your four uh, different groups of connection between the criminal element and the state and revenue streams of that criminal element. So that it's, yeah. That's yeah, what so the, the, the state revenue streams go strongest to the... Um, the criminal revenue. No, the, no, 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 don't, don't, Larry, it goes back. The, 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 let, let's... Larry, no, no. So you're, you're interested in the criminal revenue stream, whether it correlates with these four different groups. In other words, I would think that there'd be a lot, the one where there's no very little connection to the state, you have a certain kind of revenue stream for criminal elements that are in the street more, and, and then as yeah. it goes up, you get so, corruption. Yeah, and you and well, exactly. I, I, think you, I think you got that point. The, the more organized criminal groups, and especially the ones with more collaborative relationships with the state, tend to derive more of their revenue from their from state sources than less organized and organ groups that have a more contentious relationship with the state. Larry, and then Kathy. Um, I attended a presentation by Robert Kagan the other day called entitled The Jungle is Returning, and that there is some concern that with all the populist forces going on in the world today, that the world's getting worse. and then. Someone responded by saying, no, if we just practice the ideals of the Enlightenment, the world's going to get better. So my, my question to you is, is crime going to go down in the next five, 10 years? Is it going to get worse? And I'm thinking uh, particularly of Mexico with a new president, and in the context that Mexico is planning to be one of the largest economies in the world, and I guess I have in my mind, how can you become, how can a country have great economic growth if it has a lot of crime and other forms of disorder? And supposedly, President AMLO is going, is of a different kind. He's the, going to do things differently. Well, so I'm, in, well, I, I'm I, interested in what your forecast for Mexico is. Well, there's no forecast. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I hope that the arc of the universe bends towards justice. I think that in the context that I have looked at, um, if the arc of the universe bends towards justice, it's because people work very hard and fight to promote less conflict and peace um, and to control other types of not visibly violent crime. Um, that said, um, you know, there's an interesting book published last year or this year by a guy named, uh, a sociologist named Marcelo Bergman. Uh, who argue, the title of the book tells you what the content of the book is, but it says more money, more crime. And part of the, his argument is that as incomes increase and as you grow the middle class, because there's more money in society, there tends to be more crime, more money to buy cars that people can steal, more money to buy drugs. So growing economies do not promote less violence or less crime. In fact, they can promote more crime, right? And this is an old argument you can go back and talk about in, in, you know, in conflict studies, right? It's not absolute poverty that promotes, that promotes violence in societies, but often relative, relative poverty, right? Or in the context of crime, right? As incomes increase, there are more opportunities for crime, right? And I think that that's sort of really important to sort of, I think, keep your eye on, right? In terms of what's going on in, in, you know, in Mexico, it, it's hard to predict. Um, I think you're going to see a change. I think that uh, the PRD, just as the PAN, has less interest in sweeping some of this type of crime, which is often politically connected in the PRI under the rug. Um, but, you know, this is all, you know, it doesn't mean that there isn't corruption in the PRD or there won't be corruption in the PRD government. Um, so there's a lot left to be but seen. It's the Moreno government now. It's an entirely new party. Entirely oh, for AMLO? AMLO's created an entirely okay, new well, party. Okay, well, sorry for that mistake. But So the the Mexican left, right? But that doesn't mean that there's going to necessarily be less corruption. We're planning some events on Mexico next year. So we'll be discussing yeah. crime. Kathy? Um, in your model, that's, it's interesting, the, the quadrant, quadrants that you put up. 
How do you think about the state um, at the national level, uh, the st true state level, and the local level? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the police reform work and the policing is done at the local level to try to change things. And yet, um, there's often conflict between the national government and the state government, often sometimes with the national government actually having to intervene in a state and remove a governor and, and other people because they're in such collusion with um, criminal elements. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, there's a history of that. Um, and you know that I think that, that, that you know, disaggregating the levels of government is sort of one strategy to, to looking to those types of collaboration. Um, to control, um, to looking to those types of collaboration to control, um, to respond to and control violence, right? So I, was, I think I was answering someone else on this side of the room and they were saying, well, you know, if with all this corruption, you know, how do you respond? Well, one of the ways you respond, one of the ways you respond to corruption is to try and work around it, right? So it's to try and you know, if you have corruption with the state government, you try and work with the federal government and develop interventions that way. If the federal government's corrupt, you try and maybe work with local local leaders or state leaders to try and to try and address issues. Um, and that's that's something that's really important to keep in mind. It's a possibility that exists in federal systems. Um, it's a possibility that exists less so in in, in the more centralized systems, say of the Andes um, and Central America. Um, but it's always important to keep in mind the different spaces for intervention, right? So in El Salvador, right, you know, some of the important interventions have been at the local level, even though the, you know, the, the, the actual bulk of crime control policy is going to be decided by the national level, by the police, you can still seek to work with municipal leaders to implement targeted policies. So, you know, in, in Brazil, for example, you know, some of the most, the earliest innovations in, in, in crime control policies were in a, a city called Giadema, which was one of the most violent cities in Brazil. They elected a, a mayor with different ideas and she ended up developing some, um, you know, she didn't have control of the police, right? The police are state level police, but they ended up imp implementing like a bar time. They started looking at when murders were occurring. A lot of people were getting killed, like, you know, in fights after, bar, after bars closed. So they started changing the bar time. They started changing lighting, started trying to address different sets of issues. Um, I don't know if they had a municipal guard force at the time. They, Brazil has since then been promoting municipal guard forces that are under the authority of mayors. Um, and, they, and even though they don't really have full policing power, the municipal guard forces can, you know, they can stand in different spaces and sort of suppress crime in those spaces. They can, you know, work, they can walk around and they can observe, you know, different, uh, you know, sites of social disorder, graffiti that needs to be cleaned up that could, you know, potentially encourage crime in those spaces, make sure that lighting is improved, deal with, you know, uh, traffic signals and things like that. Um, so I think it really is, I think that's a good point. I think it's really is important to keep in mind the, the different levels of, of inter the different spaces of intervention that exist in different levels of government. You know, work based on your work on Medellin, Colombia. Are things getting better in Colombia? And are you optimistic? That's a hell of a question because it's not really necessarily. But if, from looking from the level of neighborhoods and dynamics in one city that you study. So uh, what happens in Colombia today depends a lot on Mexico because the Mexicans what? tend to control criminal activities in Colombia right now. Um, Mexico? Yeah, yeah, the Mexican, the Mexican drug gangs control the largest scale criminal activity in Colombia. By the way, we were made there with Desmond's uh, organizing leadership. We hold panel on gangs and things. Sure. Um, but also I should say that, that Colombia with the peace process and with the problems in Venezuela is a very delicate place right now and that there is um, growing uh, problems with, with Violence in certain areas, violence against civic leaders, and uh, you know, coca growing in the country. Um, and so, um, it's not at all clear what's going to happen in Colombia in the coming years. Um, it's really important to recognize it's a very delicate moment in Colombia. You're not optimistic. You're not pessimistic. You're I don't not. have a crystal ball. You don't. <laughs> you don't have a crystal. Neither. Yes. When it comes to democratic governance, I'm wondering what you've observed about the role of the judiciary.
especially as one of your crime control strategies. That you're not mentioning that. And the second part of my question is, what is the role of education as part of your crime control strategies? So, I mean, the main conversations about the judiciary are, um, the main conversations about the judiciary are often about um, reforms to the judicial process. Um, you know, so shifts from sort of more civil law based um, written judicial process to more confrontational process. And I think, I think, you know, making sure the judiciary isn't corrupt and that there's an, an efficient and transparent judicial system is important. I wouldn't, as I think you can imagine from the chart I gave, choose the judiciary as the primary source of intervention, right? So the judiciary deals with crime at a secondary level. Um, you have to be arrested, right, and prosecuted before the judiciary really, really begins to, to sort of get a handle on you. Um, I think that, you know, basic reforms to keep the judiciary in line are important, um, but I would emphasize other things before uh, the judiciary. Um, so beyond all of this stuff, I'd say that also dealing with problems in prisons is a very big deal, right? So the establishment of strong prison gangs and different, and, and having prisons that, that don't provide... Um, you know, the opportunity for people to, um, you know, develop work skills and to return to society, you know, in a form, you know, with the opportunity to be constructive and to stay out of crime and dealing with reentry programs, which is a very big issue in the U.S., but hasn't gotten nearly enough attention in Latin America, are other important issues. Um, where I've seen some really useful interventions on the judicial side is there are certain collaborative programs that bring together different state agencies, so including you know, prosecutors, police, educational institutions, courts, um, you know, child court, you know, juvenile courts, um, and, and different social workers that operate around those actors to, to, to build sort of integrated interventions in certain communities. And I think that judges um, and prosecutors um, can be important in those types of organizations in developing more agile judicial responses to different types of problems preventative judicial responses, right? Being able to arrest somebody for a minor crime, maybe to get them off the street for a while so they don't get murdered and set off a feud that can cause other people to die. And so I think there are some very important and targeted strategies to using judicial interventions to control crime. Um, in terms of education, um, I think that is here. I sort of put that more in the community building um, and citizen participation. Educational institutions, to my mind, do two things. They do norm building. Um, norm building, right? So you can create norms in schools. You can work with children to, you know, try and, you know, build up basic norms so they don't become involved in criminal gangs. Um, they also, you know, provide training for, you know, involvement in, 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 in the economy. Um, and, and they also keep kids off the streets. So I guess they do three things. So keeping kids off the streets and providing more comprehensive educational and uh, care opportunities, like you know, sporting events and, and, and clubs and stuff in, you know, the afternoon and the evening can be really important in giving kids the opportunity not to be on the streets and getting in trouble. Um, I think, you know, educational institutions also need to think about, um, you know, and this gets into broader questions about the economy and inequality in the region in general, right? You know, how do you prepare people for better paying jobs, right? Public education in Latin America is not designed to produce high skill workers, right, who um, are going to have really robust opportunities in the economy. Um, it's designed to produce, you know, minimally skilled, literate workers um, to work in, you know, routine jobs in many cases, the service sector or certain types of factories. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most heartbreaking things about doing work in Latin America is, um, especially if you, as you're dealing with young adults, is just the, just how little opportunity there is, right? Just heartbreakingly, like, you know, you have very bright people, and unless they're exceptional and manage to get into the right programs and get themselves into a college, most of them finish high school, and then there's really just nothing to do. There's just, you know, get a job and, and you know, sort of survive, and there's not a lot of opportunity for them to sort of maximize their own potential. The vast majority of people under those circumstances do routine jobs and, you know, take advantage of the positive things in their life and enjoy their families and, and, and try and, you know, survive. Some people are frustrated with that and may see crime as, you know, an alternative to have more income, right, to grow in prominence um, and to have a more interesting life, right, that even if it's going to be briefer 
um, is exciting and interesting and offers them opportunity and some hope even. In the end, mostly there isn't hope. Those hopes are broken. People end up in prison. Most people end up dead. Um, children end up without fathers um, or mothers. Um, and it's really tragic, right? But for a small number of people, um, you know, in, in what can seem a, you know, a, a really insidious life situation, crime provides an important alternative. Um, and schools can play an important role in, in helping to diffuse that. But I think that gets into the broader questions of inequality and the nature of, of the capitalist marketplace in Latin America. We, we heard through the media that there is a miracle in Medellin, that it used to be a very violent city, mm -hmm. and that due to the social policies and educational policies of the mayors, two or three consecutive mayors, including um, the engagement of the young people who live in the communas mm -hmm. and in transportation and all of that, that crime has gone down. So could you speak about that? Is that a, a, just a public relations campaign from the local government or to attract you know, the people to visit more? Or is it uh, something that is superficial. So, I mean, I don't, so the mayors will tell you that, um, but I don't think it's simply a public relations campaign. Um, there have been a series of mayors that have invested in making some very significant improvements to the infrastructure in Medellin, um, building a really remarkable, especially if you compare it to Bogota, which has a terrible transportation infrastructure, a remarkable metro system where it can get you around the city pretty much anywhere in half an hour, um, cable cars that are designed to connect some of the poorest areas to um, the metro system and can transport people around the city relatively quickly. Um, there was a tremendous amount of investment that went into um, the poor part of the city, the northern part of the city. Um, and all of that stuff is really wonderful and I think has um, created a framework for helping the city to um, lower some levels of publicly visible violence, right? And I think that's good. Medellin is not the Medellin of 1993 when you had homicide rates of 400 per 100,000. Um, uh, you know, and you know, anybody who had the resources to do so was fleeing the city. It's not even the Medellin of 2000 when there were 200 murders per 100,000, right? It's, 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 a, it's a mostly a nice place to visit, especially if you're in a nice neighborhood. Um, it's important to note, though, that there is still a tremendous amount of violence um, and criminal activity in poor neighborhoods, um, and that a lot of the suppression of public violence in Medellin is connected strongly to a set of pacts um, that have been arranged among the major criminal actors in the city and that have been in place since about probably 2011 there, um, and that has contributed to uh, lower levels of crime in the city. Right? So there is an active criminal pact in the city that has served consistent with my argument, to consolidate criminal structures in the city, reducing conflict, um, and changing the nature of violence in the city. Uh, I guess my question is more geared toward comparing Colombia and Mexico, where the dominant criminal groups are narco-centered. Uh, why do you feel, well, what is the largest um, or the biggest reason for this stark contrast in violence when it comes to comparing Colombia and Mexico? And do you feel that there is as uh, as stark a contrast between nonviolent crime, or is it about the same? Well, I haven't done work in Mexico, and so when I'm talking about like the like sort of this, a lot of this sort of you know well organized criminal activity that doesn't get expressed in public violence, it's really hard to observe unless you're like on the ground in Mexico, and I haven't done that. Um, what I would say is this: a lot of the criminal organizations in Mexico, um, so you know, they dominate the cocaine trade. Right, so obviously the cocaine trade plays a big role, but the, most of the criminal organizations in Mexico today have a very heterogeneous portfolio. So they do other things. They do extortion. They can try. They control the, the trade in migrants, human smuggling, things like that. So this is all. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that the criminal organizations in Mexico are. Um, you know, one thing or the other. I think they're actually quite complex criminal organizations. Even though, because of the nature of the drug trade today. They control the drug trade and they derive, you know, the ones that are dominant in the drug trade derive most of their income from the drug trade. Um, you know, Colombia's, you know, a different story, um, but, 
you know, today, most Colombian criminal organizations are pretty heterogeneous organizations. They have a lower profile in the global drug trade, which is run by the Mexicans. They um, still play important roles in the Colombian drug trade, so the growing of coca, the processing of coca, the preparation of the coca for shipment abroad. Colombians play a big role in that, but Colombian criminal organizations make a lot of money doing a variety of other things. There's a lot of extortion in Colombia. You know, Colombia sort of pioneered some of this oficinas de cobro, right, these collection rackets where, you know, basically you run a, a group of assassins to collect debts. Um, Colombia, you know, has an increasing problem with um, illicit mining in certain parts of the country, especially around Baja Calca. Um, Colombia has, uh, you know, long had problems with kidnapping, extorting oil pipelines and things like that. Um, but Mexico has a lot of those problems too, right? You know, different Mexican organizations have, you know, attacked oil pipelines and there's been problems with kidnapping. I mean, I, I, you know, Mexico has its own particular history. Um, but I, you know, at least I see, based on what I know about Colombia and Mexico, sort of a lot of symbol. They're becoming more similar rather than less similar. So I'd like to change location to Jamaica, mm -hmm. and uh, you briefly mentioned that the situation there is is very grave because of the integration of criminal uh, organizations in, in politics. Yes. And I, I wonder if you could expand on that a bit and whether uh, the situation is improving at all with the new, uh, failing the article of the Prime Minister. So, I mean, Jamaica has, you know, the 1970s were the height of political criminal ties, right? So in the 1960s, after independence, the government, the, the Jamaican political parties armed gangs to gain control of neighborhoods and political constituencies. And certain, neighbor, certain regions of the country, um, especially around Kingston and Spanish Town, right, the neighboring uh, suburb, um, have parliamentary constituencies that have for, you know, most of the last 50 years, um, with one special exception around uh, an election in the mid-80s that one of the parties simply didn't participate in at a protest, have consistently elected a member of, from one party rather than the other for, you know, 40, 50 years. And that's because of the existence of what they refer to, what some refer to in Jamaica as garrisons, which are these neighborhoods which are led by criminal groups and then ensure that you get turnout in, in, in those neighborhoods. In the 1990s, the Jamaican government undertook a series of reforms um, that uh, sought to uncouple this relationship somewhat, uh, in part because the 1980 election had been so violent right, uh, in, in Jamaica. And they, they, they were seeking to sort of reduce those ties, increase sort of the anonymity and honesty of elections. And those efforts were, you know, modestly successful. Elections today in Jamaica are not nearly as violent as they were in the 1980s, right? There's not a huge amount of electoral violence in Jamaica anymore. There was still some electoral violence, I think, in the early 2000s. I haven't heard of any lately, but I haven't sort of been keeping an eye on uh, an eye out for all of it. Um, but the, the recent elections have been largely peaceful. Right? There's no problem with them um, in terms of sort of public expressions of violence. But criminal organizations continue to control these neighborhoods, and they continue to have ties to the political parties. So they may not be confronting each other in the street, but that neighborhood is still going to vote the way. Of its, of its historic political affiliation, right? And that decoupling hasn't happened uh, in Jamaica. So, um, you know, the, the nature of the criminal activity, the nature and the practices of violence have changed significantly, and I think probably for the better. Um, but it's important to recognize that these criminal organizations still exist on the ground, they still maintain their party ties, um, and that still drives a lot of elections in many constituencies in Jamaica. Devon, any, any theory as to what's happening with the Mariel case in Rio? Which? Mariel, Mariel. I must too bad she can't live because he cares deeply about uh, that case. Uh, as a young woman, leader, black... Uh, a member, she, member of, the, the, of the city council. City council who got killed. Assassinated. By members of... So what, so probably what? by members of the police who are affiliated with a... An extortion racket, which are these milicias like I found in Rio de Um, You know, I've talked with a lot of people about this. I was actually in Rio 
um, back in June at a meeting that was partially about that, run by political allies of hers. Um, I I don't think there have been, I mean, I don't know if anything's changed very recently, but I do not believe that they have made progress. I think the people who... But Raul Jum and the Minister of Defense still claims that they do have, they know, know, they know who did it and it's some people from the militias and... Yeah, and, but some of them turned up dead and it was one of these very complicated, a very complicated case. So Mivisius have been seeking to assassinate Certain politicians in Rio have been involved in violence against politicians and judges for some time in Rio. Um, Maria Di Franco, um, who was this activist from the PSOL party, um, was uh, a city councillor. Um, the, the leader of that party in Rio is a guy named Marcelo Freixo, um, who they had a hit out on many years ago because of his efforts to investigate them when he was a state, as a state senator. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of tension around this and the Milicias really are not sympathetic to that party. This is the first sort of, within Rio de Janeiro itself that I know of, political assassination associated with sort of the militias advancing their agenda against other parties. Um, there is some, I, in my own research, um, was aware of some militia, violence within a militia trying to affect elections. And one of the people I was researching was murdered after, um, after, after I finished my research um, by his political opponents. This whole question of violence and crime and all the correlates we've been discussing got worse in some ways after the onset of democracy in the, in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s. Are we to conclude that democracy has failed and this is a provocação, no? Yeah, well, I mean... Well, has democracy not really done well with uh, dealing with uh, crime and all that? Well, I think... So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not crime, crime increased... I mean, crime increased lots of places around the same time, right? So I don't, I don't think that... I, I think the demo, democratization is coincidental. Colombia democratized... Colombia never really democratized. Colombia, which had worst, the worst crime of any of these cases... Um, had a rel had a short-lived dictatorship in the 1950s, saw a decline in violence after that with the the Sitges Pact, um, and then crime really took off in the 1970s amid democ amid like a long-standing democracy. Jamaica, um, crime is increase in violence is associated with decolonization, not democratization, right? So it's, I think I don't, I don't think it's I think it's just sort of happenstance in some of these places that it, that it's connected that, that it, it coincided with democracy. I think though that it's really important, um, as I argued in, in the edited volume I mentioned earlier, um, to distinguish between political regime and how governments manage violence, right? So we had this idea um, in the 1970s, or political scientists had this idea in the 1970s, that you had, um, you know, when you were looking at violence in Latin America, you know, that you had the systematic state violence being exercised against dissidents to repress dissent against these authoritarian regimes who are very often engaged in large-scale state building and political reform projects where they were seeking to sort of change the nature of, of, of their societies, often through the exercise of, of large-scale repressive violence. And the idea was that you'd have a transition to democracy and that, you know, the government would, you know, as being responsive to the people, stop engaging in, you know, large-scale repressive behaviors. What ends up happening is twofold. First of all, repressive behaviors on the part of police, especially against poor um, and, margin and, and ethnically and racially marginalized populations, um, just continue to pace. Um, I haven't really studied it closely, but my guess is, based on everything I know, that police in Colombia, Jamaica, um, Brazil have long targeted before the dictatorships, during the dictatorships, and after the dictatorships, poor and less white populations. And I don't think that ever stopped. I think that was always out there in terms of police violence. Um, so that, I don't think, materially changed, except for the fact that the countries got more violent in general, and there was more conflict, and as that was going up, that made that type of repression and abuse worse. But the second thing that happened was that 
not just with the advent of sort of a robust global cocaine trade, right, but also, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, with the advent of relatively effective um, high qual with the high quality civilian weapons, right? And I'm talking here about access to things like AK-47s, AR-15s, right? Assault rifles. Um, that criminal groups, which in previous years had had access to, you know, uh, you know, straight razors. You know, you have Pedro Navaja in that Ruben Blades song, right? Um, or or revolvers. Suddenly in the 1980s, just because, you know, high quality combat arms, civilian, co high, high quality light combat arms become more readily available, criminals have them, right? And that dramatically increases uh, the level of violence in these societies, right? And there are, there are other transitions also associated with the democratization process and the changes in the nature of the economies in these countries, I think, that... Um, in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s begin to diffuse violence out of the state into a variety of different private hands. Militias, private security firms, drug trafficking organizations, guerrillas, um, which with, the, with access to better weapons um, makes those, gives those organizations greater capacity to repel state presence in certain urban neighborhoods and in other areas of these countries, right? And so what you begin to get is what I call at times violent pluralism, right? So on the one hand, you have democracy, right? Political democracy, political pluralism, right? But you also have a new regime in these countries of how violence is managed. You might have a democratically elected government, but the state doesn't necessarily control the exercise of violence in these societies the way we expect it to in sort of normal Weberian state theory. Not right? only worse. Right. So what ends up, what tends to happen, what, what happens is you have democracy existing in parallel with different practices of violence, right? And what political leaders try and do is they try and manage that, leading to these types of collaboration that I was talking about, right? Um, and it looks like it's democracy doing it, but really what you have are two separate things. You have democracy operating on the one hand, and you have this regime of violent pluralism of this of how violence is being managed in these societies operating on the other hand. They're happening in parallel and they're interacting. But what's really interesting and tragic that's happened in the last couple of years, if we see, is we've seen the emergence of Venezuela as one of the leaders in violence in the region, region. But it's a completely authoritarian government, right? So they have violent pluralism, but a, an authoritarian regime, right? And I think the same thing, we're seeing the emergence of the same thing in, in Nicaragua right now, where you have a diffusion of violence into society. John Lee Anderson had a great article on um, you know, the use of uh, by Daniel Ortega of uh, you know gangs of sort of government thugs to repress the pro-democracy protests, right? But being run under an essentially authoritarian government, even if we haven't fully acknowledged just how authoritarian the the, the Nicaraguan regime is. So we have two kinds of society, more or less competing. We, well, we have two sets of questions, right? We have authoritarianism and democracy. Democracy is about electing people to office as opposed to having people installed in office, right? And then we have centralized Weberian notions of the management of violence, right? And then we have plural practices of managing of violence, which is the reality in most Latin American countries today, but certainly not all. I think if you talk about, say, you know, Chile or, or Uruguay, right? They control manage. over violence is much more centralized, right? And, you know, you can sort of use more standard Weberian models to understand, you know, practices of violence and responses to violence. But when you're talking about Northern Central America, most of Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, uh, parts of Peru, Venezuela, lots of the, a lot of countries in the Caribbean, you're talking about violence being diffused out to different social actors, and you're talking about a lot of the political practices that go on either under authoritarian or democratic regimes being focused on managing how that violence operates in society. Ten years ago, more or less, you and I and, and others, members of the, the seminar we had, were awed when we learned from you and others, actually the guy from Stony Brook, about the rise of drug trade, mm -hmm. which was booming in the Andes into Brazil. Yeah. And opening a whole front back there. and. I think that's the force, the vector that is feeding the weapons. I think we said that at the time. Yeah, well, certainly. That the, means that the, the drug trade, which is increasing, is aiding that other type B society, violent, et cetera, et cetera. 
again, and the, the, the Democrats have a tougher time. Would you assess both points, the, the drug and the impact on the, this, I, I, this I don't think you can dismiss the impact of the Indian drug yeah, trade. Yeah, please, Michael, you want to be heard by the posterity. I don't, I don't think you can dismiss the role of the Indian drug trade in promoting violence in the region. Um, that said, I think you have to recognize that there are other modalities of crime that are contributing to a lot of violence. Northern Central America, the Matas are largely extortion rackets that occasionally rent their services to drug trafficking organizations. Um, the other thing that's important to think about is that while criminal, you know, highly organized and well-armed criminal organizations are often generated by the money associated with the drug trade, when that money gets cut off, um, those groups still have guns. And then they use those guns to engage in other criminal activities that perpetuate crime in society. So Jamaica had a dramatic decrease in its participation in the global drug trade, right? But the effect wasn't to control violence in Jamaica. The effect was to take gangs that had formerly been dealing drugs and turn them into extortion rackets. Well, so many hands. Uh, shall we take them all in one? We take three and then see how much time we have. Yes, yes. Larry and then... Can you uh, comment on Venezuela? I've been told that another... Make it as brief as you can. Yes. Uh, another presentation that the military has now become part of the international crime networks. And the other aspect about Venezuela, I, I was struck to hear this, 50% of the medical doctors in Venezuela have left the country. Well, yeah. I, don't, I just saw a story today that said 90% of Venezuelans are in poverty. So anybody with, with skills and the ability to leave is trying to leave. Um, I've been... I mean, I've done some work on the ground in Venezuela. Um, it's a really scary place yeah. to work. Um, and, but I don't really have time to cover that. Um, there is a lot of information about high-level um, members of the Venezuelan military being involved in the drug trade. Venezuela, as I understand it today, is one of the principal narcotics corridors out of Colombia. And there's actually a string of municipalities um, that run between Colombia and Caracas that are very, very violent. Do we have the guts to take that uh, process, those processes on in an open discussion in full in, in the future? Venezuela? I, mean, I could talk about, I could do another presentation <laughs> no. on Venezuela. We need, we need allies, but let, 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 some of that needs to be done. But uh, yes, obviously Venezuela is a very important case. Very general. Very question. hard and very complex. With uh, the degree of weaponry in this country, the uneven uh, economic situation, mm -hmm. what are the main factors that you think, why is it mass incarceration? What, what are the main factors why in this country there's a significant, there has been a decrease in crime and also uh, much less than in Latin America? Well, so the United States pioneered um, sophisticated georeferenced crime analysis, right? So I said that's like one of the starting points for controlling violence in Latin America is initiating that. But the place where it really started was right here in New York City, right? New York City is also a place where, you know, crime policy evolves, right? The, the city government, the police here are very sophisticated um, and they know how to develop new responses, right? There's a lot of investment in them. I mean, CUNY has a whole college dedicated to the study of criminal justice, right? The investment in this is like off the charts, right? Um, the, um, and so I think that's one part of it. I think the fact that um, we're largely a consumer market makes a difference, right? You know, we don't have a lot of drug, there's no drugs growing. Um, I think that, you know, I, I've sort of been criticizing the institutional approach, but I do think that institutions make a difference. I don't think it's the entire answer, but like we have had it, um, you know, historically in the United States, um, you know, relatively reliable institutions, effective police forces, um, if not everywhere in the vast majority of municipalities in, in the country. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, while I think there are a lot of problems with mass incarceration, um, mass incarceration, if your sole goal is to like reduce crime, it is a modestly effect it's a mod it's an effective strategy for doing it. I don't think it's the only way to do it. I, I think the problem with mass incarceration is that it has very substantial collateral effects uh, net costs for society, right which don't make it viable as, as a single solution. But yes, if you throw lots and lots and lots of people in jail for committing violent crimes, you're going to probably tend to have less violent crimes. 30 seconds, why should the U.S. promote Latin America? 
Which of the, I think it should promote local capacity and effectively enabling people to develop their own responses to the problems their societies face. And mm -hmm. I think they should find ways of working with people who are committed to reforms to support them to advance long-term agendas to address the problems facing their societies. We're not doing that now. I mean, right now it seems like we're debating about whether to foment a coup in Venezuela. Yeah. That's like our principal policy. Very fine. We have 30 seconds. What is, the, what is the role of the media and technology in either escalation of crime? And also, um, what is the role of journalists? Have they been accurate in reporting to us what Very is transpiring? Question. So, I mean, it's always incomplete, right? Because criminals know that they don't want certain things reported. Politicians don't want certain things reported, and they pressure journalists not to report on things. Um, in certain places, especially in Mexico, a lot of journalists who report on crime have been assassinated. Um, and so that's another major issue. Um, and that said, I think the media has done a really important job in promoting information. Um, I think the more transparency and the more information you have available is the better. Obviously, you don't want that to be sensationalist. You want it to be serious reporting. But the more that's out there, in general, uh, the better. Um, and like I once gave a talk to a bunch of high-ranking municipal, like municipal officials from Chile. I don't know if they're particularly high-ranking, but a bunch of municipal officials. And like one of them, one of them asked me, he's like, oh, you know, what do we do about the press? The press is always creating problems. They report on things, and it's embarrassing, and it complicates our efforts to, I don't know, whatever, promote ourselves. And, and, I, and I, I sort of took a page from, um, uh, you know, a, a Brazilian scholar who's become, who became for a while a policymaker and is involved in policy debates, a guy named Luis Eduardo Suárez. Um, and, and he said that, you know, one of the key things that the governments need to understand is that transparency about crime is always better than a lack of transparency. Because, like, when you have a crime happen, if it doesn't make it in the newspaper, if the government's not talking about what they're doing, right, if they're trying to sweep it under the rug, it's going to get worse, right? And then eventually it's going to get in the newspaper and it's going to be that much worse. And then maybe even you'll find out that people will find out that you were trying to sweep it under the rug. The better thing to do when crime gets bad is for the government to report it, to gather the data, provide an, ac you know, provide an accurate and a clear accounting of what's going on, something that's not sensationalist, and try and control, and, and try and not control but to direct the media narrative in a way that's constructive for solving the problem rather than simply increasing public uh, anxiety or creating some sort of panic in society. Right? Somebody want to have a last question here? Well, come on. Yes. Go. It's related to that question you raised before, but I, to what extent has U.S. Yeah. policies and programs affected the level of crime and violence in Latin America, and I think of the correlation that's been in Central America between the active U.S. intervention and the much higher levels of crime and violence. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't help that the U.S. is the globe's primary drug consumer market, right? right? So as they say in Mexico, right, so close to the United States and so far from God, right? Um, but the, but the, the, you know, the United, the United States... You know, the United States has sought over the last 20 years, right, to promote economic development in Mexico and Central America, right? Not just to control crime, but to control migration to the United States, to, to shore up the stability of the governments in, in that part of the world where the United States sees itself as having a material security interest well beyond its interests in, say, even Colombia or Venezuela, which it has interests in. But, you know, the U.S. government, I think, really does feel a concern about, you know, what would happen if, you know, some of these cities on the border really do dissolve into disorder or you know, there's a mass migration crisis associated with that. And we've seen sort of bits of that happen over the years, like with the, I think it was the 2015 migrant child crisis from Central America, right? Professor Enrique de Monarias, gracias. Thank you for okay. the talk. Good to see you, to hear, see you back. Thank you, Mauricio. A lot of the topics you want to go over, so let's thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.